Education, by and large, uh, is probably the biggest uh, uh, lesson to be learned, is that ultimately education can be every bit as exciting uh, as, uh, as, as entertainment. Uh, and there have been some sidebar conversations that, you know, uh, where professors, teachers who are, are fun uh, are sometimes ridiculed by their peers because if uh, they're popular, if they're entertaining, if they're engaging. They certainly can't be serious. Uh, but ultimately, what you want to have in a student body, uh, as well as with the educators, uh, is it an engaged group uh, that uh, inspires curiosity uh, and invigorates uh, learning uh, and instills passion. Uh, so uh, I think it fundamentally comes down to what we do or attempt to do in entertainment all the time, which is tell compelling stories. Uh, and I think that's ultimately what learning is. It's about creating compelling stories. Um, I wanted to talk a little bit about something that, um, OK. Thank you. Um, something uh, that Real Networks has been um, doing for the past, um, actually, 10 years. I, I've only been there a few of those years. Um, and it's just an, uh, kind of an interesting, uh, I think there's some uh, interesting um, parallels with some of the things we've been talking about today and also some of the challenges. Uh, Real Networks uh, works with, every summer, with CBS, and we work on a, a project called Big Brother. Do any of you watch Big Brother? Yeah. I knew this was not the uh, target audience. We've got one. We got one. Wow. Okay, that's better than I would Or one that will admit it. <laughs> that might be possible. Um, so what, um, what we do, this is a television show where 12 people are locked into a um, house and then they vote each other off every week. Um, standard reality show there. Um, the unique thing about it is there are 50 cameras in the house and those cameras are streaming 24 hours a day. And what we do is on the internet, we stream, those, we stream four of those cameras every day, uh, 24 hours a day. Um, and we have tens of thousands of people who um, pay us money to watch those. Um, and uh, they, we, um, one of the things that we've learned um, at, since we started was that um, certainly content is important. The content's got to be compelling, as you say. It's, it's, it's critical that there's something there that people want to watch. But what's really, the, the other thing that has really uh, made a huge difference and in, in grown the business overall is the fact that we've added an enormous amount of community around that. That um, I used to uh, look a lot at interactive television and I had this sort of aha moment that people don't want to actually interact with their television content. They want to act with each other about the content. And um, over the years we've put in a variety of different levels of, of um, uh, community technology, so we can have live chats um, that, uh, and we have chat rooms again full, 24 hours a day, um, and also message boards for people who don't really want to communicate in real time and, and want to have those kind of less um, involved communications. Uh, other people who will just read the blogs and leave a few comments. This year we added Twitter. We added actually, um, and Twitter was rapidly embraced by our community, which I have to say is really much more on the tech phobic side than the tech forward side. But they were motivated because they care about this content and they care about the community. And so this idea of bringing all of these people together who care about something passionately has made a community of people who come back year after year and are very um, excited, and they create the, they create their own content. Um, they are what uh, keeps each other there and, and engaged uh, all the time. Uh, so I think that this uh, this idea of having very compelling content and an ability for people to express their con their their passion about it, but in a way that's most comfortable for them. Not everybody wants to be, not everyone is an aggressive talker, is an aggressive chatter, um, but everybody, almost all of our, our, our users really want to engage at some level. 
Nathan, what makes a compelling story? Uh, fundamentally, characters. Uh, I, at the heart of any good story are good characters. Uh, really, because good character, you're interested in, uh, in, in characters, and you will basically follow them anywhere. I, in many respects, it's what's happening on, on something like Big Brother. I, it's not necessarily a particular story that's being told. It's these particular people, and you want to see where they're going. And I think learning is a lot like that. Uh, we're, we are following either something, a creature, an object, uh, through a series of events, uh, through a process, uh, going on a journey with it. Uh, these are things that, 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 that matter. And then uh, I think uh, what we're also seeing today is the sort of multi, multi-platform dimension uh, coming to the front. Uh, it's not a linear uh, static enterprise uh, anymore where you're, you're engaging only in one place at one, uh, at one time. Uh, your entertainment is extremely portable, uh, and I think the same is true for education. People will learn anywhere, seek information anywhere, uh, and pull together various components in different ways on different platforms and in different places. In one of the demos that Candace didn't get to show, where they start to tell, they use video to start to tell the story about places and solving problems using chemistry in the video, it, it really starts to get compelling. If, if we're going to start building more tools that have more uh, uh, courseware, more interactions with each other, and we really want those stories to be better, how do you guys think? that the education community can get better at telling those stories? I mean, what can they borrow from? How can they learn from entertainment about engaging in those so that the story is one side of it, and yet the analytics, the calculation, the math, and the science that underpin it live together? Because, because it, I have to admit, a lot of the educational videos are actually pretty boring. <laughs> um, well, <laughs> they are. And they're, I think sometimes they're, they're also limited by uh, by budget, and you know, certainly if we have $300 million to make Avatar, uh, that's going to be a lot more compelling than, you know, than, than, than a lecture. Uh, but <laughs> all of our professors were aliens. We could find something a little interesting. Motion capture, that's the answer. Motion capture the oh, academic. There we go. Blue screen. But I, I think it is also um, that ability to get across the, your own passion for for whatever the subject is, and, and I, I was a, uh, majored in chemistry and physics, and I had teachers, their excitement got me excited about what it is that I was learning. John Silly Brown, who wanted to be with us and is out of the country, was talking to me about some of the compelling professors who are now getting uh, a lot of airtime on the internet. I mean, people are just watching their lectures because they enjoy them so much, and uh, it's interesting because if those they seem to be characters telling a pretty good story. And yet, right now, people are watching them for the entertainment value, but they're not necessarily uh, being hooked up to the academic side of the house. Do you think that there's a good way to do that? Learning doesn't happen all at once, necessarily even in the context of a traditional class. Uh, but I look, at, I look at how we can use, uh, use entertainment to help tell stories. I'd like to see a more informed uh, writing, producing, directing base where we can form these kinds of partnerships uh, with the academic community to instill ideas. I'd like to see more movies that become a springboard for discussion and work with educators. Not that a movie should be a documentary necessarily, but they be interesting enough so that they can then foster a discussion. Uh, take advantage of the pop media and the pop culture uh, that entertainment offers uh, as a catalyst for discussion, for learning, for course plans, for curriculum. And I think that that is a, a critical piece, is how you tie that content back in. So I'm, um, I never travel without having a bunch of TED Talks and things from the, um, uh, and, and lectures on my, um, my iPhone. And, um, but, 
I do those. It's great that I have them, that they're portable. I watch them, and it's, it's, it's a terrific opportunity. I think that the idea of being able to access video anytime I want to, anytime I have time, is really terrific. But at the same time, I'm not tied back into a community. I'm not tied back into a learning environment. These are sort of single, one-off pieces of information. And I think that there's, there's, there's two parts to it. One is it's great to be able to have technology where you can carry things around and, and watch it any time. But it also, there's a tremendous value to real time. And um, it's, it's one of the things that we found out with, with our work is the idea that something is happening right now that brings people together and they communicate about that is very, it's, it's a very powerful thing. Even if you're not co-located, the idea that you are sharing this in real time with, with your, your uh, cohorts is, well, is very I, and powerful. And I think a lot of people during the financial crisis, it was sort of like pop up economics 101, right? Like everybody got really smart pretty quick about all sorts of things. And um, I think this American life and the giant, giant pool of money that they did was maybe one of the most educational pieces about the financial crisis ever done. And yet it was done in this sort of combination of somewhat entertaining, clearly, but also educational. Yet it was never tied back to the, uh, and it was never tied back to a university structure. I have no idea if it was used in classes or not. And yet it really explained uh, the, the situation in derivatives in a way that I'd never even heard in school. So I, I think it's interesting. I want to open this up for just a couple minutes because we're going into the working group. Ralph, and then, uh, then over there afterwards. Thanks. I, I have a very different kind of question, if I may ask. Uh, every school I work with in the Los Angeles bases, basin now has a film school. And we're now seeing a lot of animation programs and the like, and we uh, networking programs and the like. I'd like to know, what are you looking for when you hire people? What kind of programs, how much content, both for both of you when you hire, because uh, when we hear about uh, the needs of what industry is looking for, is it content, which causes disciplinarity, or is it the breadth of skills, is it creativity? Uh, but both of you, let's say, are on the cutting edge, so what are you looking for for new hires of recent graduates? That would say a lot about what we should be doing and preparing. Well, I think the curriculum changes from time to time. Uh, one of the things at ImageWorks that we uh, instituted a few years ago to address this is a public-private partnership that we call IPACS, where we've been working with, uh, at least at the college level, we've identified the top computer graphics, animation, uh, uh, computer science uh, programs in, around the world and work with these schools to help them develop their curriculum. We also offer fellowships to uh, uh, department heads or you know, professors to come and understand our production environment so that rather than a traditional internship where you have an intern come through, they get all of the learning. We're actually trying to uh, bring that learning and experience back to the campus so that they can be better informed. At the heart of your question, though, is what do we really look for? We look for, on the one hand, thinking skills. So the Bennington College idea of thinking people who are also doers is critical to it because a lot of the problems and skills that you could teach today may or may not be relevant when they actually come to work for us several years from now. So their ability to problem solve, their ability to think is of utmost importance. The other thing that we always look for in our environment is their artistic ability, less their technical uh, skills. We're less concerned with somebody who understands all of the software. If they have the ability to communicate action, emotion, uh, or passion, uh, and performance in the characters that they create, whether that, no matter what technique that's, uh, that's done in, uh, that's what we're looking for. So uh, for our digital artists, uh, their artistic ability, regardless of uh, the medium, is one of our critical things. One of the things that I'm sort of hearing as a, a thread through the various components today is that uh, we need to maybe get people through a process that they really learn storytelling and really learn the, the power of connecting at the human level, and they also learn the power to build and create and do on the fly. And 
maybe that begs the question from a curriculum perspective, how do we create mechanisms for everyone throughout their career to constantly be pushing both of those two aspects on a regular basis? We have a uh, mic over here, and then Cameron has a, a comment over here. Two quick points. One is uh, working with things that are entertaining and fun is so self-reinforcing that from a curriculum standpoint, we, we have to be careful not to make entertainment the outcome, but learning. We were challenged this morning, I think, by Liz about if we really want to uh, make change, we have to bring it all the way down to very basic human elements. And entertainment and fun is reinforcing. And I'll spend time with things that I think are entertaining that I'm not passionate about. But almost the measure of what I am passionate about is that I sort of take a swing at it, even though it isn't fun, right? And I think that there is, um, particularly uh, enabled by some of the some of the social uh, media opportunities, the challenge to make a difference, to feel like I can contribute, and that it's me, and it's my voice, is self-reinforcing at a very basic human level, as is the, um, the opportunity to belong to something bigger than myself. And so whether that's a community or whether that's a collective deliverable. And so when we, when we can set this up in a way that I can participate and, and as, as, a, as an agent, uh, sort of an agency component, that's a part of it. And by participating, I feel like I've that I'm part of something now greater than myself. And I've got two things that are hooking me at a very gut level to, to, to swing away and to continue to contribute. And that becomes motivation. And it's one of the things we're trying to do within the company, but I also think it's one of the challenges in the education sector that we really have to try and crack that code. I think, I think that being part of something greater than yourself is, is a really interesting attribute that right now a lot of times the students don't necessarily whatever they're doing, don't understand how they're contributing to a much bigger thing than they are. There's some interesting data about um, women returning to the workforce and continuing with education. And the women in national security do it, uh, return to their jobs and the workforce and continue training more than many other fields do because they feel that they're doing something much bigger than themselves and they feel like their children are important but that what they're doing for the world is important. And that it's, it's, uh, it's, strongly reminding me that that, as we look at um, the platform, the curriculum, the tying in together, how, how might we do that? Cameron, you had a comment? A few days ago, I was in a, a panel discussion about um, technology and education, mainly through younger kids. And one uh, woman was lamenting the fact that her six-year-old was the only one in her class without an eye touch. Right? That she was under a lot of peer pressure by other students to give her child a, a, an eye touch. Um, I want to kind of take this on a more global level, and, and really it's kind of a question um, to, to both of you that if we're trying to create a much more global education system within higher education, is the avatar-like game um, the best option, or should we be going for something that maybe is more of a sacrifice from the well bells and whistles for us in the consumption market, but much more kind of uh, uh, inclusive so that, you know, we can rewrite the, the education system for anthropologists and so that there is a two-way communication rather than, you know, this is the top game for learning and eventually people in Africa and in South Asia will eventually get to have a version that's kind of like this. So I'm talking about kind of backwards engineering games that they're more inclusive and is that something the two of you are playing with? Uh, I'm a huge believer in um, creating content that you, and, and applications that you can use on a phone. I think the, they are with you all the time, and um, the range of things that you can do with them I think is very powerful, and um, the adoption worldwide, even in, in countries with you know, very low GDP is is phenomenal, and um, I think the uh, you know trying to get the high processing power distributed throughout the world it's a big problem. But people can use a phone immediately, and they and it will enrich their lives, and um, they are motivated, and and they'll get them. And I think that is um, a really really important platform worldwide. I think one of the things maybe we can take a page, you know, from Architects for Humanity, uh, with a little bit of open sourcing on you know, game design and uh, gameplay, because I think that while entertainment is a mass medium, uh, there's also something very powerful about personalizing it uh, to 
a region, an area, a subject. Uh, because the other thing that, that is really what attracts people to any of this is its relevance to them as individuals. And uh, I think it's very difficult for somebody, uh, say, you know, in you know, an office here in California to necessarily know exactly what's going to be relevant to the same degree that somebody on the ground somewhere around the world. So I think there are opportunities there. Uh, and I'm speaking more from my own personal point of view than any you know, grand corporate scheme. Uh, but I'm certainly aware of what is possible. Uh, and I, I think that's one of the things that, that, that could be possible. Make that engine available. Uh, and then smart people uh, closer to the people uh, will come up with some brilliant ideas on their own. Yeah, one, one other thing is um, my company also uh, is um, works in the mobile space worldwide, and it's interesting. After using a phone for communicating, for 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 speaking, um, when people have some additional um, disposable income, the 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 top things that they spend it on would are games and sports and music. And um, I think that again, if you can start to use games and music as a way of of you know, employed in education, make it something that people want. Um, great opportunity.